and welcome. I am Beth Seymour, ACT Human Rights Film Festival's Managing Director. We are a program of Colorado State University's Department of Communication Studies. Happy Cinco de Mayo, and uh, we are honored to have you join us tonight. While we continue to be physically distanced, ACT will program online events in order to build awareness, connection, and to support our most vulnerable community members, and in order to keep connecting with one another. With that in mind, I invite you to introduce yourselves and say hello to one another via the chat function. You will also be able to ask um, our special guest, Director Addison, uh, questions in chat. Tonight's program is possible thanks to support from campus and community partners. Uh, we thank CSU's College of Liberal Arts, City of Fort Collins Fort Fund, Colorado Creative Industries, I Center of Northern Colorado, The Lyric, who we hope will be opening soon so we can once again someday convene in public. And uh, our work is only possible through the generous support of all of the individuals and campus and community groups that uh, support us. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Addison Wright. Addison is a filmmaker and creative from the south side of Chicago with more than seven years of filmmaking experience. He's collaborated with several Chicago musicians creating stunning visuals for their music videos. Hip Play, Because We Can, is an official sec uh, selection of this year's South by Southwest Film Festival. Join me in welcoming Addison. Hello, how's it going? Hi, welcome, and thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. We are so grateful to have you here. Um, first, I just me. wanted to tell everyone they are uh, welcome to to add chat connection uh, to text you questions in the chat function, and I'll go ahead and moderate those, and then I'll just go ahead and start the conversation. So thank you. Um, so just starting with, um, what was your concept, or how did you conceptualize this project? So I learned about the hip play ballerinas over uh, social media. So I was on Instagram and um, I was on the explore page and I saw these girls doing ballet to uh, all this hip hop music and the way they were moving, I was intrigued by it. So um, the day went over or the day went on, the next day I saw more videos. Then the next day I saw more videos and I was like, wait a minute, let me look into this. Um, so I did a bit of research and saw that they were from here in Chicago. So um, I always had this idea of creating a, a film that's a ode to Chicago. Um, I'm born and raised from the south side of Chicago, and I um, really wanted to shed light on how amazing these girls are, but at the same time, like, uh, show something that's, that's positive for the city and something that's um, encouraging and uh, inspiring. Um, so I reached out to Homer Hans Bryant, the uh, the founder of Hip Play, um, and he actually responded to my DM. <laughs> so him and I sat down and I started conceptualizing and just started flushing out ideas and ways to um, highlight the girls, but at the same time, give them a, a uh, give them the floor pretty much to express how Hip Play is, um, is this art form that lets them express how they feel, but at the same time, give them a platform to talk about some of the adversity that they face as well. Very cool. So when did you start working on the project? So it started in the spring of 20, 2018. Yep, spring of 2018. I, I think actually I reached out to Homer at the end of 2017 and started conceptualizing and doing all the pre-production at the top of 2018. And um, from there, we went to doing more pre-production and we didn't film until September of 20, 2018. Wow. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the founder of Hipley, Homer Hans Bryant, and he is a member of the uh, incredibly prestigious Dance Theater of Harlem. Mm -hmm. um, and he appears in your film very briefly. Did he in, influence the actual trajectory of the film, the artistry? Um, oh, yeah. And yeah. then also, oh, I'd like oh, to, yeah. oh, sorry. And then oh, I no, also no, no. want to hear more about how Hip Lay, um, how it, it as a dance movement was founded, if you, if you yeah. know that. Um, Homer, first, Homer is a 
he's a legend. Um, I got a chance to, you know, really spend a lot of time with him and sit down and talk to him. And I've never met a guy that's like so energetic. And I mean, looking at Homer, he's 70. I believe he just turned 70. Super youthful guy. Um, he actually gave me the idea to let the girls speak because at first it was gonna be a it was gonna be a performance piece. I did want the girls to to talk and kind of explain what hip play is, but it wasn't until him and I sat down and you know he was like, we we did a piece with um I don't want to put the name. Well, I guess I can say the name of the magazine, but I believe it was W Magazine. Yeah. I can't remember. And um, they did a spin on it where they took some of the, the negative things that, not the negative things, but they, they, they made it seem as if all the girls came from, you know, this certain background and like, you know, they tried to put that spin on it because, you know, they're African-American girls. So they wanted like a, uh, they wanted a story that can kind of pull on your heartstrings. So they used that. Um, but he was saying that every girl doesn't come from that background. All the girls are different. They come from different areas. So he really wanted to really wanted to have me focus on who they are, what they do and what their purpose is. So Homer was very instrumental in the uh, just the outline and form of the way the film is. That's very cool. And I, I did look at the uh, W Magazine article and it mm -hmm. does have some of that sort of oppression Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, themes in it and I appreciate yeah. that your film is so inspiring and life affirming and uh, and feel good absolutely um, we uh, we loved your film as uh, the comments we are getting several comments to that <laughs> I love your film I love your film <laughs> thank you um, so much guys a question from our artistic director Dr. Scott Diffriant. Um he asks just as the dancers blend different musical and choreographic idioms so too does your film combine different stylistic and formal elements, shifting from a dynamic color sequence similar to a music video to black and white talking head interviews. What prompted you to fuse these disparate styles? So my, um, my background, I started with doing music videos. Um, I was born, was born in the 80s, grew up in the 90s, so I was very tuned into MTV while they actually played music videos. Um, so that's my that's my background. But the whole, the whole purpose of doing that was I wanted to change formats throughout the film. So your eyes never get tired. And, you know, it starts off with this short form, short film section where Homer does come in and uh, you're introduced to who he is. And then from there, it goes into um, the title, title screen and it's pink letter. So it kind of pops out. So everything's really refreshing. And then I went to a different uh, aspect ratio um, at one point when you first see Jada, when she's performing, um, and then going into the black and white sequence and the 4-3 the four three aspect ratio. I just wanted to change things up so much that the viewer never gets tired and everything's upbeat and your eyes are just refreshed and you, you know, you see one thing that's different, like going from the section where it's dark and all of a sudden the girls throw their arms up and they're all in pink. You know, you sit back and you kind of like, whoa, this is cool, you know. So I really wanted to have that um, that approach with it. And I think it works. Um, it, it it does have aspects of being a music video, but it transcends that genre and is is mm -hmm. just tremendously powerful. We've gotten several questions about the editing process for the film. If you wanted to talk a little bit more about how you approached that. Yeah. Um, so with the edit, uh, the 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 finished well final version that you all see today. Um, I think that was the ninth edit. <laughs> so we did, we did a few different ones. Um, we had Homer and Jada come in and they watched, watched the cuts down a few times. Um, but it took, it took a while to actually get to um, the film that we have today. There was um, certain parts of the, the black and white section um, we filmed the girls, that whole interview section was about an hour, about an hour worth of footage. And we only used about three minutes of that hour. And the girl said so much, so much, like just powerful things. And it, I, I wanted to keep it down to about a nine minute film because I wanted to use the rest of that footage for maybe like a director's cut or something down the line, because I do want to do an, um, an adaptation to it 
that focuses more on Homer's story uh, down the line. But um, but yeah, the the editing process. My my coworker at the time, I was working at a VFX company called The Mill, and The Mill. Um, my my friend was an editor. Well, actually, he he was a um, I could say he was an editor. So editor there, and um, him and I sat after work every day and. We would cut it down, cut it down. The DP and I would sit. We knew which shots and which angles and which sections of each uh, take we wanted to use. So we knew on set what was good and what wasn't good to use. Um, so we we played with the edits. Um, his name is Andrew, the editor. So he would edit and I'll check it out. And then he would send me the premiere project and I would kind of play around with it and send it back to him. And then here, revise it, tighten it up. So it just took a while to get to that final edit, but it was a lengthy, lengthy process. I'm gonna say we were editing for like two months. So it's um, it's super tight. I, I think you can tell that a lot of love was given to the film. Yeah. <laughs> um, and actually, so leading into to talking through the editing, um, and again, this question is from uh, our artistic director. How much did you uh, and cinematographer Dan Franz and the dancers work out the choreography in advance so mm -hmm. that the camera, which weaves across the dance floor, would not interfere with their movements? And also, how many hours of dancing filming did those sequences take? Oh, wow. Um, so leading up to um, the actual filming day, we visited the dance studio. So Jada, who you see in the beginning, she, uh, she did the choreography. And the first time we visited the studio to see the choreography, it was me and Dan. I had my, um, I had my DSLR and she showed us the entire choreography from front to back, but it was just her. So we saw it, we filmed it, we went back, um, back to the office to edit it down just to kind of see what some things we can cut out and then we the next week all the girls were there so it took us a while to um, learn different lanes that we had as they moved around so I want to say we visited visited them at the studio maybe about three maybe three times possibly four times um, watching them do the choreography and just doing blocking um, the day of filming, we realized that the blocking that we did was for the size of a dance studio. <laughs> so we get to the ballroom and it's just this massive space and we were like, okay, spread out. <laughs> so we had to actually um, re-block everything the day of. Um, and that took, it took a little bit of time each for each scene. Um, the girls would spread out and we would kind of find our way. So my, my, my favorite part of the choreography, we, we call it the snake part. Um, the camera starts wide and then it follows each girl and kind of moves around. Um, so that took, that took about an hour just to block. Um, yeah, it took an hour to block, took about 20 minutes to film. But throughout the day, I want to say we filmed for, I want to say it was like a 10 hour day. It's a 10 hour day. It took a long time. And the girls, they performed so many times. I felt, I felt bad <laughs> towards the end of the day because um, I knew they were tired. I knew their, their feet hurt. And yeah, we had to do over like 80, 80 takes of just like the entire day. So it was, it was a pretty, pretty long process. <laughs> Wow, and uh, and throughout all of the takes, the dancers are smiling, and and you definitely yeah. don't see the fatigue on them. Uh, you mentioned that you were filming in Chicago's Grand Ballroom, and uh, was why did you select this venue? And this is a, a question from Carol. Okay, um, that's a great question. So initially, I wanted to film in the um, the South Shore Cultural Center here in Chicago. So the reason why one, it's a beautiful extremely beautiful place the ballroom is beautiful it's white ceramic tile but the the walls are painted pink um it, i think it was opened in the late 1800s so it really has this like grand just historic architecture it's really nice um 
the reason why I wanted to film there on top of it being beautiful was that this was um, a white only establishment until 19, I think the 1950s, I believe. So what I wanted to do was take these beautiful black women and put them in this space that they couldn't be in, you know, some over like hundred years ago, like they couldn't be in this space. And I wanted to have that as the, like the cornerstone of the film. I wanted, I wanted the, the, the space and the story of the space to speak volumes. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> we didn't have enough money to rent the place for the amount of time that we needed it. So I uh, reached out to the Grand Ballroom and this, this ballroom is on the south side of Chicago, um, but it's elevated. So people drive past it, they walk past it and they never, you never notice it. Um, and on the outside, it doesn't look as grand as it is on the, the inside. Um, so I filmed a music video there like eight years ago, I think. And I just remember walking in for the first time and I was blown away. So I reached out to the owner and he said it was okay because he remembered who I was. And uh, my DP, Dan France and I went, visited, he, he fell in love with it instantly. Um, as soon as he walked in, he, he knew like, hey, we can have the girls this part and we can use these windows for this golden section and we can do this and that. So he, his mind just started racing once he saw the place. Um, and that's how we ended up at the Grand Ballroom. It's always been a place that I've, I've admired, just the architecture and just how beautiful and, and big it is right in the middle of the South Side. Um, it opened in the 1920s. So it, it, it all worked out perfectly. It's a beautiful venue. So question from Miranda, mm -hmm. who like everyone else loves your film. Um, you. She was wondering what, uh, why did you decide to wait until the end to provide the audience with the dancers names instead of doing it while they were being interviewed? Um, and question. liked that, liked it. Uh, but wants to hear your reasons behind it. Yeah, um, that's actually really, I've never gotten asked that question. I actually didn't even think about <laughs> doing that. Um, I think the, the the reason why I wanted to save it um, at the end, I didn't, I didn't want anything to take your eyes away from the girls. So having having a lower third at the bottom would kind of distract you from the emotions and the things that they were saying. And then I knew in my head at the end, I just wanted to do this grand like title sequence and let each girl have their own, have their own section and each, each title pretty much it, it showcased their, um, what I think that their, their personalities are for each, for each, uh, for each title at the end, it kind of showcased their personalities. Um, and that just happened by the grace of God. Like that wasn't even filmed to be a title sequence. All of those shots were just extra high speed shots that I didn't use. Some, a couple of them I did use, but those were just extra high speed shots. And um, yeah, we saved those and my coworker did this title sequence at the end. And I was like, we have to have all of these shots pop up with the title sequence. You know, I, I just wanted to make it feel like the perfect thing to like cap off a film with. Um, but yeah, I mean, having having that lower third at the bottom doing the interview black and white section, I just didn't want to take your eyes away from the girl speaking, so. Well, it, I think it worked. Um, and, and I think that that was a great choice. Um, so you have tremendous experience working with musicians, and I was interested in how did uh, music or the musicians inform the film and your creative process in making this film? Yeah, so my um, so first I'll start with um, the song for the performance, uh, which is uh, Rick Wilson's Soul Bounce. So that song came out about four years ago. And um, I was going to do the music video for the song. And it just so happened that um, Rick and I, time, like the times didn't work out. So Rick and I didn't shoot the music. He ended up shooting the music video, but I didn't shoot it. And um, while I was doing pre-production, I was trying to find the perfect song that 
had the right BPM for the girls to bounce to. And it, you know, it had to be catchy. It had to sound right. And I thought about it one day and I just played soul bounce and I listened to all the words and I was like, man, this is perfect. Like everything about the song was perfect. I mean, if you close your eyes and just listen to the song and not even watch the film, the song is inspirational itself. Um, so I reached out to Rick, Rick Wilson, um, worked it out with him to get permission to use the song. And, you know, that that worked out perfectly. Um, Sam Trump, the trumpet player in the beginning that does the score, I did a music video for for him um, and him and I um, known each other before the music video also, but did a music video for him. And then I thought about it having this is my first short film. What I've, I've been inspired by Spike Lee and a lot of other directors, but Spike Lee always has that feeling of this like classical, not classical score, but he always has the same, the same person score his films. And it's always this trumpet or strings, or it, it puts you in an element that's relaxing. It kind of sets the tone for the film. And that's what I wanted to do with Sam Trump playing the trumpet. Um, just having him on, on the corner where the grand ballroom is, um, you see that um, there's a Chicago like bus stop sign. So it starts, it starts on him and then it pulls out and it just pretty much sets the tone and kind of puts you at ease and you get sucked into the film. So. It is a great invitation into the space, into the dance space. We have a question um, from Bill that is, and I, I have to read this, hold on, sorry. Oh, um, and he's asking, uh, Phila Bullis, dance company mixes dance and gymnastics. Does hip play parallel, parallel this mixing of genres? Have traditional ballet fans appreciated this creativity? So the, the, the question is, did, do, do they appreciate? Have traditional, how has hip play been received by traditional ballet fans? Got it. Um, so what I've learned from this film was that they, they get frowned upon uh, doing, doing hip play. So a lot of, um, a lot of uh, classically trained ballerinas don't look at the hip lay ballerinas as traditional um, traditional ballerinas or classically trained ballerinas, even though they have to be classically trained in order to do hip lay. And that was, once I like learned about a lot of the flack that they get, um, and, and Homer told me a lot about the flack that they get, then I sat down and talked to the girls about it. Um, I mean, they they get, talked about they don't get respected um and I, I think i think some some people that that do traditional ballet i'm pretty sure respect what they do but the majority of the comments that they told me about and some of the things that people said about them were like negative um, which is why i wanted to give them the floor to express themselves and you know say why you know you don't have to be a certain body type or because we move a certain way and you know we're, we're on point we can stay in the box and like you know just that from that I've learned that you know they just don't get as much respect as someone that does traditional ballet even though they're classically trained so so I assume uh, your, the dancers have seen your film and mm -hmm. um uh, first, what was their their reaction to it? And then second, um, you had mentioned some of your goals, overarching goals in making this film. What uh, goals do you think the dancers, or can, can you speak for what goals they had with participating in it? Yeah, so um, Jada, she, like I said, she did the choreography. And that was, um, I want to say that was Homer's task that he gave to her, like, hey, Here's this film. I want you to create the choreography for this. So she did it beautifully. The girls follow suit, did it beautifully. We filmed everything. Everything was finished. Jada saw the final cut and she was in tears. 
um, you know, she was extremely, extremely happy with how it turned out, but at the same time, just emotional in the sense that, you know, she got a chance to express herself and so did the other girl. So, and that was, that was a, um, a uh, common thing between all of them. You know, we, we had a screening, a screening last year where the girls came, they performed, their parent, well, their family was there. And um, that was their first time seeing it amongst a group of other people. And a lot of them were blown away by it. So I definitely think that they, they enjoyed it, <laughs> just seeing their reactions. Um, you know, I know they enjoyed it. And um, just seeing that, <clears throat> seeing them get emotional, <clears throat> sorry, just seeing them get emotional from seeing it, you know, that let me know that what I was trying to achieve worked you know? Um, <clears throat> but that was one of my goals. Like I, I, I wanted to take this film and make it inspirational. So people that are, um, that are coming up in Chicago, because like I was saying, I, I wanted it to be an ode to Chicago, but I wanted people to see this and just know that if you chase your dreams, you can accomplish anything. And if you work hard, you know, you can set out to do things that seem impossible but I just wanted to be able to have this as something that can live forever and, you know, it can encourage <clears throat> generations from now, so. Lovely. Well, we have a comment from uh, Gail Marie, who managed a ballet company for years and found their performance wonderful. Uh, very compelling and beautiful. Thanks for the film. And uh, I know Gail Marie is not alone in that she uh, has shared it with the local dance community here in Northern wow. Colorado. And I know right. our um, Colorado State University's director of our dance department sent it to all of the majors and instructors within our dance school as well. So oh. it is definitely being seen and, uh, and inspiring young dancers That's here awesome. as well as in Chicago. Thank and, you, thank you uh, so much. So uh, I will give the audience their prompt for last questions, last chance on questions while I ask you, uh, what are you working on now or what's keeping you busy right now? So right now I am in the development phase of my next short film. So this one is a narrative piece. Um, it's a love story based in this neighborhood in Chicago called Bronzeville. So Bronzeville is the, um, what's the word for it? Uh, during the Great Migration here in Chicago, Bronzeville was, Bronzeville was the, or is the mecca for African-American artists. So Louis Armstrong lived here, Gwendolyn Brooks, um, just a lot of, a lot of famous music, musicians back in the 50s and 60s, jazz and blues, there were nightclubs and speakeasies. Um, but I want to be able to tell this love story here that's in the current current time, but hopefully down the line, I can um, develop this into a feature and I'll be able to set the date back to the 50s. Um, but yes, that's my, that's my current project that I'm working on right now. Um, just developing characters and just coming up with the, the overall idea of the film. So I've been chopping away at that. Um, every day I write down in my notebook different scenarios or different things that I think of. Um, I went and bought a camera so I can go take pictures of the neighborhood and print those out and kind of put different scenarios with different areas in the neighborhood, so. We thank you tremendously, are grateful for your work, for your film, and uh, for your time this evening and joining us and answering our questions. We look forward to seeing uh, all of your future work, and we also look forward to when we can all go back into a movie theater together and yeah. celebrate film and dance and music yes. communally as, as uh, all together. So I, I wanted to just thank you um, and thank all of our audience members for joining us. Um, this is our last at home live broadcast interview oh, wow. for this semester because we right. are on a semester system, but we are working on a virtual program that we'll announce on our website pretty soon. So I uh, urge everyone to check that out. And, uh, and again, Addison, thank you so much. We appreciate you so much having, for having you tonight. Me. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me. That, this, this, this means a lot. And thank you guys out there that, that, that tuned in and had questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you for checking the film out. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you, know, you, you having me on and giving me a time to talk about the film. So.
and it's only available for one more day on Prime. So spread the word, and uh, and you have Thanks a you. He, we have a you're so awesome to from the audience member. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So we'll end on that that applause and uh, and that note. Thank you so much. Thank you.